point of principle uh, actually has to do with uh, safe educational workplace um, environment uh, and certainly has come up in the context of a number of very uh, unsafe environments and especially in relationship to issues of sexual harassment and sexual violence. Uh, but I think for those of us who've been involved in the Ethics Bowl, we know that there are a number of cases uh, that we've considered for the Ethics uh, ethics Bowl that have had um, uh, implications for, uh, and we would have wanted a principle like this to appeal to in the Ethics Bowl in helping to determine <coughs> the case. So you should bring yourself up uh, to, to date on, on this. Uh, in addition to this principle, the SAA does have on its website a a very elaborate set of resources that you can go to should you feel that you or anybody else you're working with uh, might be uh, in a context of a, uh, a very difficult, problematic, harassing, or otherwise uh, unsafe uh, working environment. Um, so you can actually find previous cases, uh, all sorts of decisions that have been made uh, as a, a number of task forces collecting all of these resources. So basically, you know, I'm going to skip over, but for those of you uh, again, have thought about ethics, or in say Katie's case, actually thought about ethics, um, ethics as a concept, as a dimension of philosophy, as a dimension of sort of human thought, has been, uh, has a long and complicated history. I remember when we first started the Ethics Bowl and uh, Brandon, uh, who was, uh, Brandon and I was uh, wanting to and participate. He decided he had to go back to the Enlightenment and find out all about it, so he's doing all of this incredible reading, which you can do, but definitely for archaeology, what we've seen in, in the last um, couple of decades for sure uh, is that um, many of these different topics, uh, heritage, sustainability, um, inclusivity, uh, rights, um, and, then, and the term stakeholders, have come into uh, much more of a, of a concern. Um, so just a little bit of background in case you wonder about where ethics have come from in the SAA or in any professional society. Uh, before 1991, the Society for American Archaeology did have a set of what they call four statements for archaeology. Uh, and these were regularly put in the front of American antiquity um, and Latin American antiquity when it came on board. And the four statements were the, what a, a short definition of what the field of archaeology is. Uh, they had a section on the, the methods part of archaeology that you know people shouldn't run out with pickaxes or whatever unless it was warranted. So really having making sure that the members of the SAA abided by selecting methods that were appropriate for the kind of research that they were doing, the kind of site and so forth. And if you were someone who was uh, had disregard for what they considered then to be proper archaeological method, uh, this was, uh, interestingly enough, a ground for expulsion from the SAA. Uh, none of the current principles actually talk about if you do X, you could be expelled from the SAA. So they were a little more uh, serious about some of these issues um, by the time you get to, to 1961. Um, they actually have a special little statement on ethics for archaeology, which indicated, for example, some of the um, things that uh, sort of uh, came forward a little bit more in the actual laying out of principles, but things like buying and selling artifacts, um, no concealing data, uh, responsibility to report. You can see that the nine principles we have now in some ways have their genesis in this one little paragraph from 1961. And then also recommendations for training, and as you know, training in, um, uh, is one of the, the components to the current principles. So there, it, there was a uh, interest and concern, uh, certainly by the uh, 1960s. Uh, but in 1991, and a number of different things contributed to this, uh, there was a call to review and reformulate the, uh, those four statements. And two of the primary catalysts, and probably the first one, had to do with whether or not the journals of the Society for American Archaeology should publish articles that dealt with looted data. So really it was the looting of archaeological data and therefore the a value that was given 
to those data when somebody published an article that drew on that data. So that the impetus and it actually became a bylaw uh, of the SAA, and the journals developed a principle about not publishing those articles that actually uh, involved or in some way used um, looted data. So that was really one of the big uh, impetus, if you will. Um, but the other was the recognition, wow, 1991, just after the passage of NAGPRA, for example, recognizing that the context in which archaeologists were working was definitely changing. Furthermore, by 1991, we really had seen uh, the expansion and explosion, really, of the development of so-called contract or cultural resource management archaeology, um, and there were a number of responses to that. Um, at the time. So this is the kind of context that made archaeologists sit down and, and you know, sort of grapple with these things. You know, what, if you want to know any more of the details, some excellent, excellent articles. Everybody should own this. It's a 2000. This is the second edition um, of the publication by the SAA, which gives the background, talks about how all these things came about. And you know that it's really, I, in many of the essays, <coughs> Uh, you know that some of them are really going to be deeply um, put together because some of them have been written by Alison Wiley, who many of you hope have read, a philosopher who's done a lot of work with ethics, especially in relation to archaeology. She actually um, worked a lot in the early years about some of the uh, issues related to shipwrecks and looted data from shipwrecks and what we should do about those. So, uh, in 1991, these were some of the kind of issues that people felt were really, really important and were mobilizing uh, a, a review um, of the uh, ethical situation. So, and, you know, in some ways, I put these together um, at different font sizes. So you could see what really was motivating people was primarily, as I say, looting, destruction of the archaeological record to a certain extent, the commercialization of the archaeological record. But then there were these uh, development and the implications of CRM, as well as the concerns of other stakeholders for finally making, a, making an imprint on, on many people, especially those regarding descendant groups and here in North America uh, with uh, indigenous and, and uh, First Nations and Native Americans. So um, in 1976, uh, again, riding the crest of the development of cultural resource management, we began to see the, the, the development of specific organizations of archaeologists uh, that would have their own ethics and even would have grievance processes in, in hand so that you could actually bring a case against somebody for unethical behavior. Um, and this was first called the Society of Professional Archaeologists, or SOPA, in 1976. They turned it into a register where people would be not just a society, but actually join, uh, be on record as being a member, and therefore adhering to the goals, expectations, and guidelines for being a member, which was called ROPA, and that eventually just got shortened to RPA, the Register of Professional Archaeologists. <coughs> Most people today, especially if you're in um, cultural resource management of any sort, uh, are members of the RPA. It does have a grievance procedure, which is what the SAA does not have, um, uh, but uh, and doesn't theoretically want to have. Most professional societies uh, don't have them, but some certainly do. Um, and what this all concerns in the 1990s led to was the creation of a task force on ethics in 1991, which resulted in the first edition of Ethics in American Archaeology that came out in um, 1995. And they had a forum at the SAA meetings. They had discussion groups. They had circulating essays and so forth, uh, which came into, they, they sort of got everybody involved um, in thinking about it. So what came out of that task force was that in 1993, they had an NSF-funded meeting, a conference in Rio Negrado of the task force to try to update the policies. And the first, you can read about the whole thing in the um, edited volume by Allison Wiley and Mark uh, Lina. And at first, it was just six principles, but they then um, continued the discussion and ended up with the eight that you see before you. Now, since 1994, 95, there really has been no official action on the part of the SAA, even though, even in framing 
this particular, even the 2000 edition of the ethics, it was pointed out that dealing with ethics is always open-ended, it's always provisional, it's always should be under revision. So it's kind of uh, strange that there hasn't been any movement on the part of the SAA as an organization to revisit its ethics um, in some way. Um, so, uh, but it's happening now. As you can see here, um, we have Mark and uh, Allison, uh, the book, the different edition. Uh, Mark was uh, going to head this next um, uh, revision uh, sort of thing. He was the chair of the Committee on Ethics. Uh, a Committee on Ethics was actually created by this task force. Uh, the SAA didn't have one per se at the time, but unfortunately Mark passed away uh, at a far too early age uh, just this past uh, summer. Um, so uh, the committee has, has uh, taken up the charge, unfortunately, uh, without Mark. Now, this doesn't mean that archaeologists haven't considered ethics, that there's been a spate of them. I think one of the early sort of um, important uh, statements was uh, the work of um, uh, Katie or Karen Vitelli, you know, with her book in 1996, um, Archaeological Ethics, which then was revised and co-edited by her and Chip Colwell. And you can see just some of the other um, kinds of publications that are out there, and these are just a selection. So there has been a lot of interest and concern by practicing archaeologists, the one by Phyllis Messenger actually <coughs> addresses the whole ethics of cultural uh, collecting, you know, who, who are the collectors and, and cultural property. Now, even though the first principle, as you'll see <coughs> here, this is called stewardship. And the story behind this, I'm not going to go into it, but it's really fascinating um, at the conference how they came to figure out that there should be something about stewardship. And I think how this, they thought, was going to really sort of solve the problems. But we learned very quickly on that stewardship was interpreted differently by different groups, uh, that it also had the implications of the archaeologists as imperialists, that they were somehow not just the analysts of the data, or collectors of the data, but they were the stewards of the data, even when working with uh, local groups, we'll just say local, whoever they, they may be. And so uh, probably the most important critique of uh, the, the concept of stewardship came out in a nice article by Allison Wiley, our book chapter, uh, The Promise and Perils of an Ethic of Stewardship. So already within uh, 10 years, uh, at least some of our members were beginning to grapple with what are the implications and the problematic implications of, of some of the um, ethics. And I strongly recommend this um, uh, particular article. So one of the other very interesting things that happened, um, and we'll talk a little bit about it if we have time at the end, was that in 2008, a group of people at Indiana University, including Ann Tyburn and Norma Hill from Indiana University, but at the time Sonia Adwai was there, uh, Larry Zimmerman, uh, Chip Colwell, and others, Dorothy Lippert from the uh, Smithsonian, uh, gathered together to say, we need to have a conversation about where we are with ethics and so forth. So while the SAA per se wasn't doing anything formal at the time, nonetheless, groups of concerned archaeologists were getting together to talk about it, and they published an open letter to the SAA membership in the archaeological record in March of 2009. Um, and uh, we'll go back, they, they, one of the things that they really were advocating was having discussions about ethics and people sitting down. And if we have time at the end, uh, they took each one of the eight principles and they set out some questions that everybody who is working as an archaeologist should actually sit down and think about. So we can uh, go over some of those. It's very useful. Um, I can ascend it to, and I think it actually might even be on a, um, uh, a website or a Facebook page for revising ethics for archaeology or whatever uh, that Mary Zimmerman set up. So um, in 2014, the SAA uh, board uh, issued a charge to the Committee on Ethics, which is the one before us that we should be thinking about. And this is that the current principles of ethics focuses on obligations to the archaeological record. 
uh, rather than to other constituents or in, without considering other constituents as well. And the board charges the Committee on Ethics to review the current principles, whether the current principles should be expanded to address the ethical obligation of archaeologists to other stakeholders, individuals, and communities. So the way in which the Committee on Ethics interpreted this uh, was that uh, should the principles be expanded in their entirety, not just one by one. But to a certain extent, you know, I think the board has sort of wavered on this. Uh, in some senses, there were some people who thought, oh, all we need to do is add a sentence to each of the principles to take care of the other constituents or the people part of, uh, or the relationships part of doing archaeology and therefore balance off the, what they saw, and which is rightly there, a overemphasis on the preservation of the record at the expense of understanding the relationships and the impact on local communities, on archaeologists themselves, and on people. So um, the way in which the Committee on Ethics, uh, I was not on it uh, yet, <laughs> I was added last year, uh, was to try to think about it in its entirety. So once the uh, Committee on Ethics got back to the board and said, look, yes, you know, we do think many of these principles Maybe not all, but many of these principles definitely should be um, reconsidered. Uh, the board then came back to the committee and said, great, you know, keep reviewing them, um, but please contact a lot of our other committees and see to what extent they felt the principles needed to be revised. So the committees they suggested, and, and actually um, the board, uh, the committee went to other committees as well, many of whom said, well, we don't see any ethical any, any real concerns here uh, for us with the, the principles as stated. Uh, but certainly the Committee on Museums, Collections, and Curation had some um, responses. The Committee on Native American Relations had an excellent, really well thought out responses, including providing the Committee on Ethics of the SAA with a list of the, um, the statement of ethics of a number of related groups, World Archaeological Congress, the Canadian uh, Society for Archaeology, uh, for example. Um, and so uh, really, really, really helpful. They have the Public Ed Education Committee, the Committee on the Status of Women in Archaeology, and the Government Affairs Committee. So uh, the Committee on Ethics, you know, dutifully went about collecting all of these responses as part of what they um, wanted to draw upon. So, um, in the view of the current Committee on Ethics, it was, as I said, not merely a situation of taking the individual principles, but developing first actually a foundation statement. Because we actually, in looking at the eight principles there, they're not placed in any wider context. They're just, okay, folks, these are our ethical guidelines, you know, but, you know, the, 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 what the committee was grappling with uh, was that really we needed to have a, an overarching statement about um, what ethics are, are all about. Um, and um, so, um, and then it actually might not make some of the individual principles individual principles because they might be folded into a general statement. So we began work on this by next time I was now um, on the committee. We began work on this and our plan was to develop on the one hand a, um, a foundation statement of some sort and you know we started off in our conversations with several people um, and thought that we could actually draw um, ethics. Of course, there's a number of huge developments in the field of ethics, especially medical ethics, uh, where uh, people are very much concerned about, you know, do no harm or, you know, how do you balance, uh, how do you make things equitable uh, so that both the benefits and the harms are distributed equitably among all of the different uh, stakeholders. Um, and uh, so we sort of started working uh, with some of those things, but our plan was basically to work with a couple of people on a foundation statement and then take each one of the principles um, and go through that with an advisor. We actually set out a very ambitious schedule for ourselves. In May, we'll work on the foundation statement, and you know, September, we'll do this, and stewardship, uh, the first one, and uh, October, we'll do the second one, and bring in some, uh, some advisors. So 
We, we got started out, and um, the foundational statement we talked at length uh, with Allison Wiley for maybe two hours on a Skype call between many of us, and also uh, with Sonia Adle uh, bringing in the perspective of those uh, from the Committee on Native American Relations. Uh, she also has a very broad understanding. She's not uh, someone who's saying, well, it's only about indigenous communities, it's about everything in archaeology and how important our relationships are. We also talked with uh, Julie Hollowell uh, on, on stewardship, and at the time the committee was being chaired by Drew McGill. Um, we've now got a new chair because Drew just took a tenure track job and uh, he needs to concentrate on what he needs to concentrate on. And uh, he's still on the committee, but he's been very involved. He's the one who actually got the ethics hole going uh, in 2004 as a graduate student um, at Indiana University. Um, and so uh, he will definitely uh, be part of it. So um, uh, what we've got um, now is before you are some of the principles. And what I'd like to do is, um, these are the discussion questions that the 2008 group uh, put out for each of these that I think everybody might want to address. But basically what I'd like to do is you know, turn on the lights and have everybody take a few minutes to go through the current principles, think about the charge to the committee, um, are, is this principle too much about just the archaeological record? Does it need to be revised in light of taking into consideration some of the more uh, people part of it all, uh, as well as the record part, uh, and any ideas that you might have? So even if you just go through and indicate on the little handout, uh, I'm going to use, I need to use this actually, this is data, <laughs> um, as the committee goes forward. Um, which ones of those principles you think actually could definitely need not only just revising in light of the charge, that is to bring in communities, uh, local groups, um, and uh, even aspects of ar the archaeology, um, should they be or do you think they stand all right on their own as is? And then if you have any ideas uh, or suggestions about, you know, what's missing and therefore what, should, what could be or should be included, um, that would be great. So let's take about five minutes to do that and then we can go back and think about some of the questions about them and hopefully get some ideas from you all about what you think about these ethical principles and where you think the SAA should go with them. I'll just say that one of the challenges in all of this is the SAA has over 7,000 it is probably rather conservative among some of our members, uh, a big portion of our members. And I'll give you an example, which is that when this uh, principle nine was proposed, uh, let, me, let me backtrack just a second. One of the things that the ethics principles used to be in the bylaws, and the requirement for any changes in the bylaws is that it goes to a vote for the whole membership. A number of years ago, they pulled the ethical principles out, but they decided with that ethical principle number nine that they would nonetheless put it out to a vote to the membership because, well, our, there are ethical principles. We wanted to know how the membership felt about it. The idea here from those proposing it was that who was going to vote against an ethical principle having to do with a safe working environment? There was a huge backlash. Now, it did pass did vote, but there were a lot of archaeologists who even wrote blogs about the fact that basically get your hands out of my field work, get your hands out of my relationships with my students or my colleagues. This is not what my professional society should be doing. So getting an, an agreement on the part, and you know, we're in the Berkeley bubble, we can't believe that there will be people who would say these things, and if you like it, I can send you some of the blog, which really took the board aback. They thought that it was basically a mom and apple pie kind of thing, that everybody should endorse these things. We all think there should be a safe working environment and so on and so forth. But there were quite a few archaeologists who felt that um, this was meddling in their, their personal relations, right? So thinking about that in terms of, you know, some of the kinds of things that some of us felt would be 
important to do to change some of these um, principles. And even in crafting a uh, framing statement, um, which, as I say, um, you know, having respect for persons is part of one of our commitment, you know, and having that we should be mindful to do good and to avoid harm wherever possible. Uh, these are the kinds of things that actually some of our colleagues in the SAA would find they, they were not, not going to vote for something like that. And that is none of our quote unquote business, right? So uh, having to deal with some of these, and of course some of us have some other ideas about, I mean, for example, the, the, the Committee on the American Relations gave us five really very good um, comments on what they would like to see. Um, and one of them is something that probably most, many members of the SAA would not accept, especially in terms of one of the terms. So what they would like to see, for example, would be, well, one of the um, ethical statements would be that the members of the SAA acknowledge the primacy of indigenous knowledge, intellectual property, and cultural rights in respect of indigenous heritage. There would be members of the SAA who would say, not primacy, but the importance of indigenous knowledge, intellectual property. And there would be some who would definitely not accept that it should take primacy. So that's just one issue, not that we're, you know, um, the others uh, that they suggest are, are certainly, you know, perfectly uh, reasonable to many of us. Um, but um, nonetheless, the, uh, and we, we went over a number of the words, a lot of words, in a, in a background statement are things that uh, some of our communities would object to, such as the use of the term negotiate, uh, which some of our members suggest is really, uh, if you want to negotiate a working relationship, uh, that negotiate is too much of a business term, uh, and that it actually involves, you know, sort of confrontational, one party against another party or whatever. So even some of the words that are being suggested are things that, that have, to, have to be considered in some way or another. So anyway, um, just a little aside, uh, it's likely uh, what will happen will be that there will be uh, whatever happens between now and next spring, there will be discussions, there will be a forum at the SAA meeting where any changes will be presented open to, you know, it'll probably take a number of years to make any kind of changes, especially in a, a, a process where you need and want to involve as many members um, as, as possible. But for the start, I have to credit the board for saying, wait a minute, our principles actually are overemphasizing the priority of the record at the expense of uh, the importance of the relationships that we establish with those communities where we are working, uh, and how do we sort of recognize this, and how do we uh, bring back or bring in for the first time uh, perhaps the importance of these relationships and these people, and, uh, and acknowledge the importance of some of what we do uh, to various communities and uh, so forth. So um, anyway, let's just, I'll stop babbling. You can take a few minutes and just write a few things and then maybe you can go through some of them and deal with some of them. If you didn't get a list of the principles, then you might be able to do work. <coughs>
credit for somebody else's work. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Right. Um, and I, I would also say, you know, we, the, uh, again, this one has the, the stewardship in it, number five, it has stewardship in it, and to the extent that we find stewardship to be problematically framed, um, that would be a red flag in there. And also, of course, uh, after the very last sentence, it says, after which these materials and documents must be made available to others, including local and other affected communities, not just other archaeologists. Right. Lisa. I had two comments, actually. Um, one was, again, to focus on the archaeological record as it is now um, relating to both probably stewardship and uh, records and preservation. And I, I don't know if there's any way for the SAA to mitigate against us, but one of the issues that comes up with actually trying to follow these archaeological ethical principles is not having things like institutional support to properly curate the archaeological record and to look after it in the long term. So having proper storage space, climate controlled space, that sort of thing. So the idea is that we are looking after this for future generations, which is something that we as archaeologists, of course, agree with. There's also a problem of actually trying to do that. Right. And the other comment I had actually comes back to your comment about um, the, who has the privacy in right. determining these things, which I, I would be one of those people that would object to that, actually, right. Right. Um, for, for a couple of different reasons. But most notably, I work in a part of the rural, so we don't work very closely with what we would call stakeholders or indigenous right. Native American First Nations communities working in the Middle East, giving privacy to one group over another, especially when claims can be very tenuous actually literally starts wars. Right. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. so that's well, I, I don't think video ethics is going to go from primacy to anybody, and that's in fact one of the motivations, I think, for reviewing these kinds of things was, you know, that in fact, in some ways, it looks like uh, we have tended to give primacy to the archaeologists, and rather than give primacy to anybody, we ought to sort of recognize all of those people who might have a, a say in it and be in a, a dialogue and a conversation with those. And, what happens is going to vary enormously from case to case, situation to situation. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure you're not the only one to give privacy to anybody, right? I'm sorry, I feel like I'm having a bit of QE, so I don't need to get full talk. But the, um, did you talk about last week as part of the red up into what you're talking about here? What happened here last week, directly, with um, Native Californians coming to talk about intellectual property rights and, and their stakes and the kinds of data we generate and how that's disseminated to the world more broadly. So the issue of principle number five and number two kind of coming together in a community that can be, like, like Lisa's saying, in a different sense, damaged by broader access to the kind of data we generate. So you know, a community going for federal recognition who doesn't want to have certain types of data out into the world without some sort of sense that they can control that. Um, <clears throat> to prevent damage to themselves. I mean, there's broader, you know, repercussions for IRBs and all of that, yes. But um, I'm thinking five and two uh, come together in ways <clears throat> um, not well articulated for the living communities that are in these moments where the archaeological and historical data actually significantly weighs in on standing matters, water rights, federal recognition, land rights in which the data more broadly disseminated could actually be used against them. And you know, I literally have an archaeologist taking my stuff and cherry picking it to say something about a community that will cost them their water rights. Right. Well that's certainly one of the suspicions that happened in Standing Rock. Right? Right. And and we know from that that many, many years ago in Southern Africa uh, some of the ideas uh, that, you know, Richard Lee and the earlier studies of hunter-gatherers as mobile and not having any, ten having any land tenure or having any bounded territory were used against them. Oh, you don't have any land, so therefore we're not taking it from you. You know, you, 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 it's reported in the record that you guys move around all the time, right? So, uh, so it, it, exactly. And we, of course, have a hard time imagining what those other kinds of ways in which people can use information Use it against against you. Oh, I, I was um, still on number five. Um, I think that what you're also talking about is the issue of traditional knowledge mm -hmm. and that as a kind of intellectual pro property is not really considered in this tool. And my other 
um, in this principle number four, we've already started to realign the um, committee and the ARF to community engagement rather than outreach, which is like, again, taking the imperialist view that we, the archaeologists, reach out to you right. as as some, some kind of, you know, we're giving you in, the information. It's like being stewards. As opposed, yes, it's it's quite related as opposed to a two-way community engagement idea. Right, and that's, that's important. And also the whole idea uh, that I think comes out of a lot of um, current scholarship on collaborative practice, which is uh, the co-production. So that when you're actually doing an outreach event or community engagement event, that you're, you're co-producing the event, you're co-producing the information, the ideas, and so forth. So that concept <coughs> from collective practice of co-production uh, is also missing here. Right. Uh, two issues. Well, the first one is closely related to what Ruth said. That I think it's important <coughs> to emphasize that collaborative archaeology is not only to do outreach and uh, implementation together, but to come up with the research designs together right. with stakeholders. Right. And I think we all teach that in yeah. our classes. And uh, if there's a way to indicate that in only principle number four, a little bit more, I don't know what we mean. <coughs> and uh, uh, in Sonia's talk uh, Thursday, I talked a little bit about um, in environmental studies, there's a lot of emphasis on what we call transdisciplinary approach, which is very similar to our uh, collaborative stakeholders are uh, part of the group to discuss right. the goals and uh, um, the research design. Right. Now there actually are groups um, within a society that are objecting to the continued use of the word stakeholder. Right. Uh, yes, that it actually suggests that, uh, you know, you could divide up right. stakes among people and some groups right. would have more of a stake in it than others and you would get preference for that. So right, and large companies, companies could be a stakeholder, but uh, that's not what happens. So we, uh, I started to put a lot of emphasis on underneath the land, just like when we talk about the technology of the And in relation to that, notice that the title is Principles of Archaeological Ethics. In, it doesn't say where. It's clear the Society for American Archaeology, so it's in the Americas, but with a focus on North America, uh, number of forces, Native Americans, and other ethnic uh, groups. It's a bit um, unbalanced at this point if you kind of the focus shift between the US and North America and the rest of the world. Right. And that might be a way, and I think it's kind of tied to the issue that I noticed that Alison and I had a long discussion about who owns the past, and I explained the situation in Japan. Nobody owns archaeological remains, it's um, everybody's, not even the Japanese people, it's everybody. And uh, uh, we didn't have a conclusion, but I, I can see that it's a tricky issue that it's not easy to put in the principles, that it might be a way to reflect some of that. They did, yeah, they did debate that um, quite a bit in the, the task force and the meeting that they had in 1993 um, about a given the fact that there are many people who are like ourselves, who are in American training uh, environments, but actually work elsewhere with different kinds of communities and so forth. And uh, to what extent do people like that, you know, um, engage with the, the ethical principles that's written right now? But that's where I would say that even, um, you know, in our conversation with Sonia, for example, about this foundation statement, she was very clear about some of the kinds of ways and places that she said things about um, Native groups or descended groups or whatever. She said it just should be about everybody. And everybody should have that perspective. It doesn't have to be divided up into these categories. Right, yeah. Right, yeah. It's just, you know, that old Aretha Franklin song, you know, R E S K N C T. Yeah. Um, looking at principle number six, I think that ties in pretty heavily to what other people have been talking about with five and two and one. Um, number six, public reporting and publication, doesn't make any mention on what sort of content is ethical to report. And if we're going to take into consideration that stewardship and accountability need to be revised um, with regard to the communities we work with, uh, I think there should be an explicit statement on 
how the content that's published, or what you should publish, what that content should be, um, and how that relates to the form of accountability that, that you're uh, beholden to. Right. Well, I think the other issue here to add in, since it's now, you know, the mid-20, almost 2020 or something coming up fast, uh, is we're in a digital age now. So the whole notion of how to report, what to report, what goes on the website, what's open, what's open access. You know, I'm sorry our cancer wasn't here, but it would be interesting to have him talk about their philosophy behind open access. And then, you know, who gets to say what about what goes up and what doesn't go up, and it's not just the archaeologist, or in what form is it, or who is it accessible to. And if you say you're only publishing on the web, then you're going to be the communities that don't have access to the web. So, uh, or maybe, you know, with uh, different kinds of cultural knowledge that not everybody should have access to, which is what the, what the Center of Digital Archaeology dealt with, you know, when we first started working with some communities about there being men's business and women's business in Australia, and, you know, men should have anything to do with women's business, and men, women should have anything to do with men's business, and then many groups that object to uh, actually even seeing images of people who passed away. That for some people that is, you know, a cultural no-no. So if you want people to post their images of their groups and everything, yeah, how do you deal with uh, some of these kinds of cultural protocols, really, um, in, in some of those instances? So there's, especially in the digital age, I think we're really needing to, you know, really, um, you know, sort of in interrogate some of these kinds of principles uh, from that particular Yeah? Well, you got a million and a half dollars of research. Only copy is your laptop, and your, which your grandchildren are going to say, I wonder what grandma was doing with this. <laughs> right. Well, you know, that, that's true. And of course, um, you know, so, you know, how many different media should we be um, saving the data? You know, and what, and where do we archive, archive it in different locations? Of course, Printed. Uh, digital media are. Are always changing, you know. There's software. We, we tried to read our zip disks from, you know, 15, 20 years ago. And, you, uh, right? I'm, you know, I was able to do it. Right? People lost their life. Right. People lost their entire mm -hmm. lifetime. Right. Right. And yeah. The technology yeah. shift. Exactly. One problem I think I see with this, uh, mm -hmm. these principles, it almost assumes that archaeology is like permanent, like sealed away from all other disciplines. I think one word that's really missing is, is science. An explicit kind of uh, focus on archaeology as a scientific practice. I think um, it's been it's been discussed here, but any I think for it needs to be explicitly stated that archaeology is, is a kind of scientific practice. You're getting ready for the march on Saturday. <laughs> 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 All right. Well, I think they, you know, one of the kinds of things, for example, in our early draft of the foundation or guiding statement, if you will, uh, something along the lines of archaeologists are committed to increasing knowledge of human behavior and the cultural past and the use of such specialized knowledge to reflect on and improve the condition of individuals and communities in the present. Archaeology is a collaborative endeavor that involves diverse individuals and groups. <clears throat> archaeologists perform many roles. <clears throat> such as researcher, educator, expert witness as they work in a variety of settings. As such, the pursuit of archaeology comes with complex ethical responsibilities. The principles outlined below express an interconnected ethos, a set of values that should be consulted by archaeologists as they pursue ethical practices. And then we suggested respect for persons, mindfulness to do good and avoid harm wherever possible, and equitable, equitable distribution of benefits and burdens or harms in inherent power. Um, just sort of sit down and think about it. Who's going to benefit? Who's going to be harmed? And, and how do we distribute them? Because there's going to be benefits and harm in any event, and we have to actually cognize those, take take those into account in a more conscious and explicit sort of way uh, as we begin um, as we begin any project. So that would get back you know, to your concern about you know okay, what are what's what are the harms? Ted, if you want to talk further, I know you're going to do this for the AIA, right? Yeah, on the back committee, okay. <laughs> we just change our committee structure where I'm part of the committee where a portion of this is falling to us. So okay, all right.
what do you think the roles are? What do you, how do you incorporate tools for collaborative work in your classes, you know, in your teaching? And your, <coughs> what new kinds of play? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they, they put these out and they published, uh, you know, a little, nice little article, but then these are, I, I'll go look, I didn't have time to check and see if they're still on the Facebook revisions <laughs> archaeological ethics, but anyway. So anyway, thank you all for your time and your input. And your